Hi, in this video, we want to take a look at multiple linear regression with Python. All right, so once again, we are taking a look at material from an introduction to statistics with Python. Here is the website for the code I'm using. Also the textbook uh, has some of the code for today. All right, so when we're talking about multiple linear regression, the first thing we want to do, we want to uh, think about multiple variables. Right, so, you know, so far in all of our regression models, we had one predictor variable, one target variable. Now we start, we want to start thinking about where I've got two, three, four, or any number of predictor variables possible for our one target variable. All right, so, so far, we're only talking about one target variable. If I have more target variables, that's gonna be a different type of modeling situation. Okay, so let's go ahead and let's do a scatter plot matrix. And to do that, I'm gonna use Seaborn. Seaborn is a super powerful package for data visualization. So what we're gonna do here, we're going to load the, the Iris data set. That's a classic data set well-known data set in uh, the analytics community. And what we're gonna do, we're gonna use the pair plot function to make a scatter plot for each of, the, uh, each of the pairs of data that we have. So let's go ahead and do that. And it takes a little bit, of, it takes surprisingly long time to run, honestly, kind of, Surprised by that? All right, so up here we've got our plot. And what we'll see when we look at this is that for each of the two variables, so there's a total of four variables in this data set. If I take the first and the second, I get a scatter plot. If I take the first and the third, I get a scatter plot. If I take the first and the fourth, I get a scatter plot. If I take the second and the third, I get a scatter plot. If I take the second and the fourth, I get a scatter plot. And if I take the third and the fourth, I also get a scatter plot. So now you'll notice, so that gives us the part that we, the, these upper scatter plots, we call this the upper triangle. Now down here, what we're doing, we have the same vari so the variables here are the same as the variables here. But if you look at that, you'll notice that these are reflections of each other. So the variable that is in the X coordinate system down here is in the Y coordinate. So the variable that is horizontal here is the vertical. The, ver the variable that is vertical is now horizontal. And so if I look at this scatter plot and this scatter plot, I'll see that they are reflections of each other because the X and Y coordinates are switched. This scatter plot is a reflection of this scatter plot. So here you can see the blues all are, are horizontal for the lower numbers, horizontal or ho lower values of the Y coordinates and horizontal. Here, now it's vertical with the lower values of the X coordinates. And let's see, we can come down here and we can see that these are reflections of each other. And these are reflections of each other also and reflections. So that gives us uh, uh, some good information and uh, so when, when you look at this, you have to realize that the upper triangle and the lower triangle are telling us the same information. I just want to pick and choose if there is an independent variable and a dependent variable relationship. I want to look at the scatter plot that gives the independent variable along the x axis and the dependent variable along the y axis, uh, just to be consistent. Now, one thing that you'll see here is that we have density estimates for each of the variables. So here are, here's it. And for this one, we have a categorical data of three different uh, species. And you know, the blue corresponds to one species, the orange corresponds to another, and the green corresponds to another one. And here for this particular variable, the first variable, we can see what the density estimate is for each of the species. Now, if I move down here, for the second variable, what, what's the density estimate for each of the three different species? And here, what is, for the, for the third variable, what's the density estimate for each of the species? And fourth variable, similarly. All right, so why is this important? 
Well, I can look here and I can kind of get an idea of the very, like which species has greater variance uh, and greater averages off of this. So here you see how everything's kind of tighter on this, on this density, everything's squeezed in. I can see that the blue on this variable looks like they have, there's a smaller variance. I can also see the blue also has the smallest like expected value. Down here, I can see that eyeballing that, I think that all three of the species for the second variable have the same expected value. Down here on the third variable, we can see that it looks like the blue species has the least expected value. And then uh, the, the orange and the green, you know, because they're flattened down more, they have greater uh, variance, greater standard deviation. And these, depending on the data set, um, these, are, these are pretty close, but I do kind of get the feeling that the green has a greater expected value because it's shifted to the right. And same conclusion down here. All right, so you know that's a good way to get an idea of what's going on without having to do a, a lot of work. And you, you, we can go through and pick it out. Now, if I have a lot of data, it's just not gonna fit. If, if I try to do this uh, a pairwise plot going on, um, but this is for the amount of code put into this, this is a beautiful plot. There's not much work. The Seaborn package is a good package to be proficient with. All right, so now let's go ahead and take a look at multiple aggression. And now this is gonna be a pretty simple example. And the reason why we're gonna do a simple example is because we want to you know, kind of like baby step into it. Uh, we're not gonna do anything too complicated. All right, so remember when I did regular linear regression, so when we did linear regression, we had one predictor variable and one target variable. All right, and that resulted in a straight line relationship. Now we have two predictor variables and one target variable. Okay, well, how is that gonna be different? With one variable, one predictor variable, I have a straight line. With two predictor variables that are linearly independent of each other and no interaction terms, what we're gonna have, we're gonna have a flat plane, kind of think of like a piece of paper, like floating in three dimensional space. So I've got first predictor, second predictor, and the target variable, that gives me a three dimensional space. And the reason why we're gonna work with three dimensional uh, space is because that's the easiest one for humans to deal with and still be multiple linear regression. Okay, so when we do this, we wanna take a look at how to calculate best fit using the stats models and get all of the corresponding parameters. And we wanna make a 3D plot. All right, so let's go ahead and get PyLab going. Let's get Pandas. Now let's get MPL toolkits so that we can do uh, our three-dimensional plots. You'll get specifically get the axes and let's get matplotlib going or it's you know, just the part that we're gonna use. And then let's go ahead and get the ordinary least squares uh, function for us to be able to compute what the, our multiple linear regression model will be. Okay, so next what we're gonna do, we're gonna generate a grid of numbers. All right, so we're gonna do NP lens space here. All right, let's take a look at X. All right, so what this does, NP lens space gave us all the values from negative five to five with a 0.1 step going along. So it's just, uh, you know, negative five, then add 0.1, add 0.1, add 0.1, add 0.1, and so on, all the way up to five. That's our X value. Now, what we want to do, we want to get a grid of values. So you see that I've got NP mesh grid. What this is gonna do, this is going to uh, take that NP lens space output and it's going to take the first it's going to take all the possible uh, two values I could pick from in that NP lens space output. So let's take a look. We've got the X values. All right. Notice that when I look at this, it goes negative five, then increases by 0.1, increase by 0.1, increase by 0.1, increase by 0.1, all the way up to five. 
So here, it's gone through, and it's gone from negative five to five in that point one step. Now, it repeats that. Then it repeats it again. And guess what it does next? It repeats it again, and it just keeps on going a whole bunch of times. All right, well, how many times does it do it? I'm glad you asked. Let's take a look at why. All right, now for why, what it does, it goes negative five, negative five, negative five, negative five, negative five, negative five, a whole bunch of times. Then it adds 0.1 and it does negative 4.9, negative 4.9, negative 4.9, over and over and over. Then it adds 0.1 and it goes negative 4.8, negative 4.8, negative 4.8, and keeps on going. And you see that it's repeating one value a whole bunch of times. So up here with X, it took a sequence of numbers and then repeated that sequence. Down here, it's taking a bunch of numbers, it, or it takes a number, it repeats it, increase, and then repeat that number, increase, repeat that number, increase, repeat that number. Why does it do this? Well, when I put X and Y together, it gets all possible ways that I can take two numbers from the NP lens space uh, collection of values. And so what this, is, what this is, is that this is all of the values along a grid going from negative five to five in two different directions, the X direction and the Y direction. All right, so now let's go ahead and let's use a random number generator. So we're gonna use NP random, rand n, and we're gonna generate some data. We're gonna, and this will be, so we're gonna, our linear model, I'm gonna type this out for us, it's gonna be, so the expected value of Z, this is the true value, it's gonna be negative five plus three times X minus 0 0.5 times Y Let me change this off from, oops, I did not mean to do that. So here is our model of this, that we're gonna say that Z is equal to negative five plus three times X minus one half times Y plus some random term. And that's gonna be our randomness. And that's gonna simulate all the variables in our system that we don't know about when we're doing data analytics or statistics. Okay, so let's go ahead and generate that. All right, and here we can see that we get an array and everything's structured the same way that X and Y uh, were arranged. There's a big old wasp flying around. So if I scream in pain from a, a sting, you know what happened. Okay, so let's go ahead and plot. Let's see what happens. So what we want to do I'm going to uh, get the figure going because once I get the figure, I can go ahead and start messing with the axes. Now here, I have a three-dimensional structure, yet I have a two-dimensional computer screen. So I need to do a projection. And so we are doing a three-dimensional projection onto a two-dimensional surface. A projection is the best approximation I can do of something with a lower dimensional object. All right, so now the statement, we define what the surface is using the plot surface function. All right, so now the, the view. All right, so when we think about three dimensions, we can uh, say like our, we can interpret or we can specify what our angle is from two different and we need two different angles. So think about if I was looking at a globe. I'm looking at a globe, I need latitude and longitude to be able to figure out like where I am on the globe. But that doesn't tell me elevation, right? All right, so, but to be able to, un to determine what a three-dimensional plot looks like in a two-dimensional situation, I need to give it two angles. So here, the two angles are gonna be 20 and negative 120. 
now we're saying that the first label uh, or the label along the x-axis is x, the label along the y-axis is y, the label along the z-axis, the vertical axis, is z, and then uh, we're putting on a color bar for us to be able to see what's going on to help uh, help visualize what's happening. All right, so now what we want to do, we want to fit a model to this. So what we're gonna do, we're going to first, we're gonna build our design matrix. So here, this is M. And you'll notice I've got, uh, you, know, you know, we've got X, we've got Y, and we have a whole bunch of ones. Remember when we did linear regression, when I have a whole bunch of ones in it, that corresponds to the intercept term. And here the intercept is gonna be approximately uh, negative five because of how we built the model. And now what we wanna do, we want to get the least squares fit using X, Y, and an intercept to fit onto Z. Let's go ahead and print it out. All right, and so this is the best fit of the actual uh, plane. So what this is doing, these are all values along a flat surface in three-dimensional space. And we're uh, going through and we're figuring out what is the value that our model says is like the, what would be the average for particular X and Y values. Or what would be the, you know, what is, what does the model say is the expected value of Z given X and Y? And that's contained in here. It's not really obvious to see because it's kind of an ugly format, but it's there for us. All right, so now let's go ahead and let's compute a regression model. So first thing I need to do is I need to make sure that X is in the format I want, Y is in the format I want. So you see that it's a, it's a little bit like cleaner. It's flattened out. We use the flatten function to do that. And Z is flattened out. All right, so why do we flatten out? Well, the reason why I did that is because I have to have it in a format that the ordinary least squares function can handle. So one of the biggest things in data analytics is getting the data in the right format for your goal, for the function you're gonna put it in. And the flatten function along with the data frame function is how we, we set it up so that we get what we want. So now if I set, I use the uh, pandas uh, data frame function, and you'll notice I've got X, Y, and Z. I can see I've got all the X values, all the Y values, and all the Zs. And here, if I look at the X, it goes, you know, negative five, negative 4.9, negative 4.8, all the way down to five. Then it repeats that sequence all over. So each value is represented once, and then the entire sequence gets repeated. When I get to Y, it repeats one particular value over and over and over, then it moves on to the next value, repeats it over and over and over. X, it repeats the sequence. Y, it repeats the value, one particular value for the length of that previous sequence. And then here are our Z values. All right, so now let's go ahead and fit our model. Now let's take a look at this. I'm gonna go ahead and clear the console so it's a little bit easier to read. There we go. All right, let's look through. So it's ordinary least squares. Number of observations is over 10,000. And our degrees of freedom, you know, we just subtract the number of parameters. Okay, so what is my number of parameters? I've got the intercept. X slope, Y slope, I have three parameters. When I subtract, observa I su take observations minus three, I see that our degrees of freedom for the residuals is 1,198. And the degrees of freedom of the model is two because that's three minus one. And this is non-robust because it's standard classical statistics. Our R squared is 0.987, which is not surprising because it's, you know, it was generated to work out nicely because we use pseudo random number generator. Our adjusted R squared is the same value as my R squared. So 
remember when I start doing multiple, I start using in multiple predictors, if I see R squared and adjusted R squared like separate from each other, I, ha I get worried about overfitting. Now our F statistic, this is big. That is a big value, which means that it, you know, at least one, uh, one or both of those predictors are statistically significant for giving me information about that Z variable. Now, this test does not tell me which one is significant. It could be one or the other or both. I just know that with this p-value, at least one of them is giving me some good information. And I have a log likelihood, I see B, I see. We usually use these when we have multiple models to look at and we use it to compare different models. All right, so here we have our uh, estimate of the intercept. So remember that like the true intercept was negative five. And that's pretty close. All right, all right. Now the true X value was three. I look over here and then boom, that's really close to three. And the true slope of Y is negative one half and that's really close. So our model is fitting very nicely on this fake fictitious data. Here we have our standard error. Here's our T value. Wow, those are all huge. P value is practically zero. And here's our confidence intervals. These are all pretty tight. I mean, negative 5.008 to 4. negative 4.969. I mean, that's a pretty small confidence interval. And you'll notice that five is inside here, three is inside here, and negative a half is also in here. All right, now if I look here, skewness is relatively small. Kurtosis is, you know, yeah, that's all right. Now, here, uh, you know, for this hypothesis test, that's really close to 0 0.05. All right, that's all I've got for you. I hope you're having fun. I hope you're enjoying the class. Let me know if you need anything. Take care and goodbye.